Hi, Brian Wilson here for iPlayEphonium.com, and today we're here with Miraphone artist Dr. Alex Lappins, who is the professor of tuba and euphonium at Northern Arizona University. Welcome. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. So now you're a tuba player primarily that has uh, that also plays euphonium. That's right. I played tuba for about 20 years before I picked up the euphonium, so I definitely have lived with the tuba much more than the euphonium. And I, I picked up the euphonium primarily in, to aid and augment my teaching. I really felt like I wasn't doing my euphonium students as much of a service as I was my tuba students, so I really wanted to demonstrate some characteristic playing for them on their own instrument. Now, I am, I, I'm a trombone player and a euphonium player, and as I practice trombone, it influences the way that I pick up the euphonium, and as a euphonium player, it changes the way that I approach trombone. Does the same type of thing happen with, or with tuba and euphonium? Yeah, absolutely. You can imagine what it's like for someone to play primarily contrabass tuba for many years and then move to something as small as a euphonium. Uh, when I first picked this up, I was really treating it like strictly a tenor tuba, you know, an enormous open oral cavity, huge wind stream, and I really wasn't getting satisfying results. Uh, I didn't like the sound, it wasn't a characteristic euphonium sound, and my technique didn't seem to be anywhere near as effective. So a lot of what I've been trying to do for the last few years is to select exercises and select types of practice that help me focus my sound, help me uh, focus my airstream, and really develop the heightened technique necessary for the euphonium. So are there uh, any things that you um, are there any things that you do differently on tuba that you do don't do on euphonium? Well, it all comes down to the same basic principles of song and wind. I'm sure we all are basically familiar with Arnold Jacobs' teachings. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the euphonium being a smaller bore requires a more narrow and focused wind stream than a bass or a contrabass tuba. And so a lot of the exercises uh, you might do, say, Clark study number one. For me, when I was playing on the tuba, that was just an exercise in getting through it with the repeats in one breath. It was just hard enough to execute. But for me, something like Clark study number one and the interval exercises at about page 140 in the Arvin's book, those two sets are something that I do almost every day. And the goal on euphonium. On euphonium, okay. absolutely. And I don't really do that stuff on tuba anymore. Mm. But the reason that I've, I've gravitated towards those is because each of them in their own way requires you to really focus your wind stream and, and find a very central point. And that, that idea of focus, whether it's a chromatic slurred scale or whether it's uh, large uh, articulated intervals, both of those require a tremendous amount of precision in the wind stream, and that's why those are two of the things that I really use to center my euphonium play. So when you pick up a tuba and when you pick up a euphonium, do you use different texts? Do you have different warm-ups that you will do on those two instruments? Yes, there is certainly a lot of cross-pollination. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> and for example, uh, David Vining's Daily Routines, my good uh, colleague, he's got a lot of great ideas in there that I use every day. But on the tuba, I have warm-up routines that I've developed. My, my primary warm-up routine is, um, was taught to me by rote from memory. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Rowlands from the Boston Symphony Orchestra taught me his Thunderdome mm -hmm. warm-up. And it's extremely acrobatic, covers about five octaves, and has the loudest and softest and fastest and slowest playing you can play. Um, for me, on the euphonium, I, I really prefer the traditional exercise, and this is probably because I'm not quite as developed on euphonium as tuba, but uh, I have rediscovered Arvin in a big way. Interesting. Since coming back to the euphonium, Arvin, Clark, and uh, Schlossberg, those, those trumpet studies that, of course, everyone uses in the brass world, sure. but there's so much influence from the cornet um, playing of the 19th century on the euphonium playing uh, texts. And those, those three, those are the big ones for me, Clark, Schlossberg, and, and Arvin, of course. Interesting, and those are all treble clef things. Does that help you distinguish the euphonium away from the tuba? It does. Um, there are, of course, bass clef and treble clef versions of both of those, um, and I discovered those all through my tuba playing when I was much younger. But there just seems to be a different set of priorities. You know, mm -hmm. the tuba is a bizarre instrument. The euphonium is a much more, I think, user-friendly instrument than the tuba, and there you just have to go to a certain extreme lengths playing a contrabass tuba that you don't have to do that on a, uh, on a euphonium. You can really work on finesse and uh, elegance, which might say something about my tuba playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Dr. Lappins. It was lovely to talk to you. And uh, if people were trying to find you on the web, how might they find you? 
Probably the easiest thing to do is Google NAU tuba. If you can't even remember my name, if you can just remember Northern Arizona, um, just Google NAU tuba. That'll get you to my faculty site. My email's there. Love to hear from you. Great. Well, thank you. And for iPlay, you find me again. I'm Brian Wilson.